right? Uh, I love partnering with Unlend because of their relationship focus with their clients. It's the same thing that I have. They understand that we need to work together to figure out whatever the best solution is going to be for you guys. And today, we've got a lot of interesting information for you that's um, not as concrete as we might like, right, in terms of this ACA stuff. So we're trying to figure out what's our topic going to be, how can we address this, and I thought, well, why don't I bring them some information first about change management because there is an awful lot of change that's going to come regardless of, of whatever this thing ends up being. Um, and then there's also changes that have happened recently here in Illinois in terms of our own employment law, some federal law changes, things like that, that probably will affect you. I'd be surprised if it doesn't. And so let's talk about how you might put that change into place effectively in your workplace. So the first part of this quick presentation will be talking about change management. Last half, we'll talk about some compliance updates so that you guys can have a, a good understanding of that. Um, as Bill has referenced, you've got a handout there in your packet. When I do presentations, I like to give succinct, usable tools that you can take back to your uh, workspaces. Okay, so that, that one handout can give you both a guide to the major talking points from the change management. It's also got leads on some of these compliance changes that you're going to need to be aware of. All right, so why don't we jump into it? We'll get started. You know, I was trying to think of, is there an example of some recent change that didn't go well? <laughs> Something that maybe didn't get rolled out very well and, and uh, led to a lot of uncertainty in the world. And we didn't really need to look much further than our topic today, right? I think without being political, it's safe to say this did not go as anyone had, had quite planned. And it's led to a lot of uncertainty. It's led pretty much to us being in this room today, right, to try to figure out what's next, what the heck is going, to go, uh, is going to go on? So if you've ever tried to implement a change in your workplace, right, this is not the feeling <laughs> that we want to generate. This, this is not the way that we want our employees um, to be reacting to that. And you know, maybe you've had a feeling where you look out your window, and this is the sense that you get. <laughs> Here's the people lined up outside your office door, pitchforks, torches, get them. Um, but there's ways to avoid this. Right? This is not the employee relations model we want to use. We want it to be more like, more like this, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. We want them waving that W, seeing go Cubs go, doing whatever Cardinals fans do. <laughs> Incidentally, what's the room? Cubs fans? All right, Cardinals fans? Other? Welcome to Illinois. Good to see you. Good to see you. So this is what we're going at. It, they're not going to jump up and down over every time we do a change in the health plan, right? You, you, you might not have this, but we can keep it from being this, right? So how do we do that? Well, there's a process that we need to put into place. This is detailed here in your handout. If we, if we come up with a plan to engage our workforce, that's how we're going to, going to get that result that we want. And as Bill mentioned, my world is human resources consulting. So I'm going to give you this from the employee end, the employee engagement end, I should say. Okay. What do we need to do? Determine the need for the change, plan for the change, implement the change, sustain the change. This might sound, sound really uh, simple, elementary, and, and in some ways it is, but let's, let's take that employee engagement focus with it. All right. First one, determine the need for the change. There are a lot of different change models out there of what's the best way to do this. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of good ones, and most any of them will work if you take them to heart and, and apply them the right way. What I've found is sometimes they suppose already that the change is going to happen. You know, they kind of skip this step. And it's important when a change is going to come that you really think about why this thing is happening, okay? You should define the change itself. What is this thing that's going to change uh, in our organization. You know, we're going to put in a, a wellness initiative. Why are we putting in that wellness initiative? What exactly is that going to be? Um, and we start thinking about it, putting, putting it to, into specifics. Because that's important both for us from a business perspective. But then when we need to roll this out to our employees, they're going to want to know this question of, deter of what the rationale is. They want to know the why. Why are we doing this? You know, maybe the why is, we think that we can save money with this plan uh, or this change. Maybe the why is 
<laughs> because the Fed's told us to. I, I guess that's, that's our why. Maybe the why is uh, because the CEO wants to. Now, while that might be a change that we definitely have to respond to, you can probably guess that's not necessarily going to resonate with our employees. You know, because I said so doesn't really win hearts and minds. So think here about why are we doing this change and what's, what's the rationale for it. So I said we're, we're looking for a plan here, right? And, and we're taking an employee focus. So let's say we, we've got to get all these people across this river, <laughs> okay? What's wrong with this picture in, in terms of getting these people across the river? We've got one guy, aside from that they're in a cardboard boat, all right? Which we'll excuse, it's obviously a cardboard regatta here. But you got one guy up there with the paddle. You got one guy in the back, and he's trying like heck, but he's sinking fast. And there's only two of them in the boat. All right, this, this was not well thought out if we're really talking about trying to, to get across this river, as opposed to this one. Look at how many people they got in that boat. Look at how many all have an oar are all going in the same direction. This is where we want to be. We want to be these folks. If we're trying to implement a change in our workforce, we want to get as many people in that boat as possible and get an oar in their hand <laughs> and get them moving along. How do we do that? We make them a part of the process. We engage the employees. So we need to have a plan for doing that. We need to have a plan for our change and for engaging our folks. We start by thinking strategically. So before we even really start talking to our people, before we even start rolling this stuff out, we think strategically about what is it that we're trying to accomplish, okay? What is it that we can actually get employees input on? Because we don't want to ask them something that we already know the answer to. We don't want to seek their input if we've already decided how this is going to go. That's going to ring hollow. That's going to actually work against us. So what we want to do is decide what are those things um, that we can actually use employee input on. And what it usually ends up coming down to is the how. Management tends to have to decide the what, or maybe the what is, is dictated to us. Um, but employees can often help with the how. You know, we've got to put this thing into place. Here's some different ways that it could go. What do you think? How is that going to impact your job? Is this going to overload you with work? Do you know of a faster way to do it? Those folks on the ground are the ones who really know the work, who really know how it's going to go, right? So keep that in mind. The other thing is to think about how you're going to measure success and do this at the beginning. What does a successful change look like in our organization? Put some numbers to it as best you're able, all right? you probably will not find the perfect metric, the perfect way to measure it at the very beginning. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, right? There's the old adage, what gets measured gets managed. And so we want to begin with that now. Start thinking about what does success look like so when we're done, we can figure out whether or not our efforts were worth it. And then once we've got an idea of what our components look like, once we've got an idea of what we need employee input on, um, and what our metrics are going to be. Now we start thinking about timelines. If you notice on the handout, that's, that's the, the third thing that I've listed in there. Um, we may have a deadline that we're up against, but before you really start figuring out project timelines, figure out what the project is, right? Figure out what it is that you're really trying to do. Then you can start putting some, some timelines in there, and now you can see, are we being too aggressive? Um, not aggressive enough? Is the scope too big? Those kinds of things. So think strategically. What's our next step as we plan for the change? Prepare to engage the workforce, okay? You'll also notice from the handout the, the bulk of the material that we're talking about here is all in this planning stage. This is incredibly important because when we roll this out to our employees, we want to make sure, we, in a lot of ways, we only get one bite of the apple, right? If we're saying this change is coming, we're trying to influence your opinion about it, we're trying to get you on board, we need to make sure we've got our, our, uh, our ducks in a row. We've got to make sure that, we're, uh, that we've got everything in order. So we prepare to engage our workforce. Um, again, we're talking about what is it that we want them to give input on. We need to think about how we're going to do that. You know, what's best for your organization? Are you going to go out and give employee surveys? Uh, are you going to have meet and greets, lunch and learns? Uh, what's that that's going to work best for you guys? And every organization is different. You know, one place with 15 employees is going to do this differently than an employer with 300 across six different locations, right? So think about how you're going to get that feedback from your employees. And then you're going to develop your talking points. What do I mean by talking points? That's your message. 
What are you going to say to your employees about this particular change? I think sometimes talking points get a, get a bad rap because um, people might think that they sound uh, too political or canned or um, not genuine. And I'm not talking about you know, uh, making things up or spinning things. I'm talking about knowing what it is that you're going to say and being on point with your employees. And what this does for us is that it makes sure, first of all, that we're very clear on what it is that we're trying to accomplish. When we have to <laughs> distill this down into three or four talking points, it's just for, forced us to make some, uh, some decisions about what's most important with our change that's coming out. The sec second thing that it does is it ensures consistency, both in your message and across your management team. So if you've got the same talking points and you know what it is that I'm going to be sharing to employees, they're not going to hear you saying different things at different times or at the same time, hopefully not, right? Because if an employee starts hearing you say two different things, what do they start doing? Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I know what he's saying now, but last week he said, all right, that's going to start working against you. And then it also helps make sure your management team is consistent because everybody's got the same message and they've got a guide that they can use to stay on point. So when you're talking about rolling out a change, develop those talking, appoint, talking points so you know what it is uh, that you're actually talking about. You, you are getting the message out that you want to get out to your folks. And so keep in mind that we still haven't actually engaged the workforce in this. We still aren't even to the, to the change stage yet. Now we're talking about, um, now we're ready to engage the workforce. Now we're going to roll this out. We're going to use our talking points. We're going to start gathering that employee feedback. Um, we're going to make sure that they know about it um, over and over and over and use whatever tools are best for us that we've, that we've determined. And then finalize plans using employee input. We've asked for all this info. Use it. And if an, if an employee suggestion or employee feedback has forced a change, that's beautiful. <laughs> Tell the employees. Because what you've just told them is you matter, right? We said, we were going to do this. You guys said, terrible idea. <laughs> and we heard you. So now we're going to do it that way. And we're also modeling that same behavior in our employees. We don't want that head in the sand culture where everybody just, just goes in and they just do their own thing, they put blinders on, and they don't speak up if something's not going to work. Because it's not my job, I'm not going to worry about it. You guys don't pay me for that. That's not what we're trying to build. We're trying to build the opposite. We want to be mission and vision focused, and we want people to all be able to, to chip in and share their perspectives on that. So when it comes to time to plan for the change, we think strategically, we prepare to engage the workforce, then we actually engage them, and then we finalize our plans using our employee input. And then, bless you, and now it's time to get the message out, right? Now it's, it's bullhorn time. We implement our change, and it really comes down to three major components. Communicate that the change is coming. Communicate that it's here. Communicate that it's progressing. Three simple phases along the way, and you'll notice the theme word there. Communicate, communicate, communicate. What dooms change processes is lack of communication. When people are in the dark about what's going to happen, um, unfortunately, they'll start making up their own assumptions about what's really going on. That's when the rumor mill can start, gossip can go around. Some of that stuff will probably go on anyway, but we need to be on top of our game in terms of pushing our message out there and engaging employees to keep that down to an absolute minimum. And when we've engaged them, they are part of the process. This is something that's happening with them as opposed to to them. Okay, With them, we can pull them on board and we can get them to be part of the solution. To them, people tend to push back on something that's just happening to them. You'll also notice in the handout that we've got the same bullets for all three of these. Use your talking points, listen to your feedback loops, and then adjust that as necessary. So at each of these stages, we're staying on point with our talking points, we're listening to our employees through our feedback loops, and then we're making changes wherever they might be. And to unpack what a feedback loop is, what do I mean by that? I mean, however you get feedback from your employees. And I like to keep the definition simple. But for me, it's however you get feedback from employees, and it has to be more structured than my door is always open, OK? That's not exactly a feedback loop. We want something that's really structured, that's, that's set up for a way to get this back. Maybe it's an annual employee survey. Maybe it's an online, ongoing employee engagement tool. There's some that I love that I'm happy to talk to you about that give you real-time input, input and data on employees. 
um, maybe you're having regular meetings, whatever it is, have some way that they can get this stuff back to you and then make that change or make changes based on that input. So once we put that change in place, we got to think about how well we did. Remember I said at the, at the very beginning there, when we start, when we're thinking strategically, we got to come up with some metrics. How do we know this thing has been successful? How do we know this worked? Now's the time to assess. We put this change into place. How do we know how well we did? So we assess our progress and we communicate that out to our employees. Again, this is a place where your honesty is going to be rewarded you know, long term. It might hurt if you didn't meet a goal. Maybe we want to do, we're doing a new wellness initiative. We want to do increased participation by 30%, which is pretty ambitious. And uh, we only hit 15. That's okay, right? The way you communicate that out to your employees is we only hit 15%. Here's what we're going to do to be better next time. Again, what we're trying to do is model to employees the behavior that we want to see. Set a big goal. It's all right if you, if you didn't hit it. You know, set this reasonable but big goal. If you didn't hit it, think about why and, and come back with some solutions. Right? There's another management adage that you hear. You tell employees, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. So let's do the same thing for our employees. Tell them, it's okay if you set this goal and you didn't quite hit it. But let's, let's use that and think about why. Gain your employee feedback about how the change is going. Maybe something's not working. And maybe you would never know it from your seat. But if you're talking to your employees and you have that feedback loop, you'll understand why. And then adjust as necessary. Make those changes. Tell your employees about it. So when you're coming up against some change in your organization here, which we all know is, is going to happen here uh, sooner than later, think about this process of how you can do it to engage your employees and, and help them become involved so it can help make the change more effective, help them work with you. So you guys I know are like right now, please, please give me some changes I can start implementing right now. So we will. If you flip on the back of your handout, there are a handful of changes listed there affecting Illinois employers. So Bill mentioned disclaimers a bit ago, so I will give you mine. I am not an attorney. I'm an HR consultant. I'm all about the how of making some of this stuff happen in your workforce, right? So I encourage you, as you see this list of laws, make sure and go back and figure out how it applies to your particular workplace, okay? Um, that being said, employment law is, is employment law that we need to know about. So here are a number listed that have changed in Illinois and that have changed federally that you should be aware of um, and you should go back and, and take a look at, see how they impact your workplace. A couple that I want to highlight for you, um, and I, I'm not going to go through the whole list in the interest of time, but uh, the first one I want to start with is the one that's most notably not on that list, and that's overtime. <laughs> and the overtime exemption. And actually, when Bill called me last fall when we were talking about doing this, he said, hey, there's all this overtime stuff happening. I bet there's going to be all kinds of things you'll need to talk about next spring. And I said, you bet. Let's do it. And then like three weeks later, <laughs> the, the temporary injunction came down, and, and that was that. Uh, we don't know anything else officially about what that's going to turn into or not. Um, as of right now, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a stay. It's a temporary injunction from that judge saying that, the rule that was proposed is on hold. We don't know what the, the Trump administration is going to do. I think it's probably safe to say it's not going to, to be what the Obama administration had proposed. But different sources I have seen say that they, they are considering something, some kind of change. So uh, I just share all that to, number one, say the overtime thing isn't completely dead. There's still something that could happen somewhere, OK? Um, the other piece of that is to reinforce the notion that some of these things that are on here um, are rules that can be made by different administrations, and they may change them. And so we've, some of the things that are on the list, like I said, it's, uh, there's upcoming deadlines and, and things you need to be aware of. Um, those, could, those could change. So number one is what's not on there is FLSA. Um, a couple of things that I want to highlight. The second one on the list there, employers are required to use new Form I-9. There was a new I-9 citizenship you know, work eligibility verification form that was issued by the government. That went to effect January of this year. You need to use their new form for any new hires that you have coming in. You don't have to go back and replace any old forms that you have, but make sure you're using that new I-9 form. And, and 
I'm sure you guys know how to use that, right? You need to make sure that you let them choose from the list of acceptable documents when you're verifying citizenship. We can't dictate which ones that they use. You need to verify the actual originals. So start using their form. You can just go out there and Google it from the government's website. There were some particular changes to Illinois law. The Illinois Employee Sick Leave Act, that went into effect uh, a little bit ago, and then there were some amendments. Basically, if an employer has a sick leave plan, they have to allow employees to take off sick leave for particular family members. Um, and let me see, child, spouse, siblings, parents, step parents, in-laws, grandchild, grandchildren, uh, domestic grandchildren, domestic partners. So be aware of that. It doesn't require that you have a sick plan, but if you have a sick plan, you have to allow employees to take off for those folks when they're sick. Uh, another one I want to touch on is uh, about two-thirds of the way down. Illinois expands the application of domestic violence leave law. Um, some of our larger employers in here, those with over 50 employees, are going to be aware of VESA, the Victims Economic Security and Safety Act, which basically it's like FMLA for domestic violence, domestic abuse. That's been on the books for some time, but Illinois has expanded it to also apply to smaller employers. Employers over 50, it's 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Um, for a victim of domestic violence. An employer who's from 15 to 49, it's eight weeks of unpaid leave. And employers from one to 14 employees, an employee can have four weeks of unpaid leave if they're a victim of domestic violence. Okay, so VESA applies to some folks that it hadn't before. So it would be good to check that out, see how that applies. Um, and so you know before someone comes into your office claiming that, that they want to take this leave. Um, I would recommend you check out the other ones that are listed on there, find out if they apply to you, how that works. Um, and then, when it's time to make some changes, use this change management model because that's going to help make things a bit smoother for you. With that, how was that? I made up some time though, I think. You're good. All right. I'm happy to take any questions.